special day around here. We have a, a special guest with us, came uh, a long way to be with us, uh, not only this day, but really the, the, the weekend. Jennifer, I've been spending some, a lot of time with him over the weekend on Friday, yesterday, and today we're going to be spending a little bit more time with him before they head down to the airport and uh, go back home. Uh, one of our favorite ministries that we're a part of is called Haiti Bible Mission, and it's, it's a place that we've taken multiple teams in the past, mission teams, it's one of the best mission experiences that we've, uh, really, we've really ever had here at New Song. It's just, I'm telling you, it's just a phenomenal place to go. And uh, they are making a huge difference in the city of Jeremy, which is uh, in Haiti. It's, it's really the western, kind of the, on the coast, the northern coast, on the west, western side of Haiti. And uh, it's a long drive from Port-au-Prince to get to where they are. And um, in fact, we, we, uh, we're looking at a ministry, we're looking at missions teams a long time ago, and I don't know if Mark and Lacey remember this, but we were looking for a place to, to take mission teams and really felt like Haiti was one of the places that we'd like to go. And we just came across this, uh, this site, uh, this um, uh, mission site, and we made some phone calls and we got to know uh, uh, this couple and said, hey, let's, let's do this, let's go down there. And it was just life-changing for so many people uh, here in, in our church and our church family. And we just went back, we went back again, and, and uh, we ended up planting a church down there this past year. We, we joined with Haiti Bible Mission and planted a church, and we were there. It's very first Sunday, it's opening Sunday, and we've showed you pictures of that in the past. And I'm, I'm telling you, if you, let me say this before I introduce uh, uh, Pastor Mark. Um, if you have never been on mission trips with us, you need to go on a mission trip. Like you, you just need to, you need to take that step of faith, start saving up money, and, um, and go with us. Because it is life changing. It's life changing for you. It's life changing for the people that we minister to. And I'll tell you, you'll come back with a heart of missions. When you go see these other locations and what life is really like around the world, you'll be absolutely amazed. And what was neat about this is that our, you know, my wife and I, we adopted a little girl from Haiti. And, and it turns out that, that um, uh, she was born in the very same hospital that, that this family does ministry at, that this uh, family goes and ministers to these little children in, in the hospital. And my, my own daughter um, was in that very hospital that they minister to every day. And that was not, that, you know, we didn't seek them out because of that. We just found out later on after we got to know them that, wow, the connection is there. And then we went to minister in this one town. And um, uh, uh, one day we, we went to this town that we, we called Chamberlain. We thought, and, and we knew, um, um, well, they, no, no, I'll say it like this. So they were going to take us to this town called Shambalon, Shambalon. Well, I'd never heard of Shambalon before. I said, okay, we, let's go, let's go, let's go to Shambalon. So we took our group, our mission team to Shambalon, and we pull up, and there's a sign there that says Shambalon, but it doesn't say Shambalon to us. It says Chamberlain. And we realized that that was where our daughter's biological family was living when she was born. And so we ended up being in the same town that my daughter's biological family is from. We just called it Chamberlain. So all the time they're saying Chamblon. We didn't know that that's where we were going to go. How many things is pretty cool what God puts together? If you pay attention, God does, God does really cool things with that. And one of these days in, at, at, when Delight gets a little bit older, our youngest daughter, we're going to take her down there and, and let her see really her roots and let her experience what Haitian life is all about. So this couple, Mark and Lacey, they, they uh, have been making a difference in Haiti for many, many, many years. In fact, uh, Mark just grew up there as a mission, missionary's kid. And uh, I'm telling you, they, they, uh, they are making a big, big difference in this city and in the lives of people down there. And I can't wait for them to share um, uh, their heart about missions. And I want, to, I want to tell you up front that at the end of the service, you're going to have a chance to give. Uh, to, to them as a family, obviously to their ministry, uh, just to keep funding them to do what they're doing. And I want you to pray about that. I don't, I don't want it to be a surprise at the end of the service. Uh, we're going we're gonna to receive that offering after they're, after they're done ministering this morning, and he's going to bring the word to you this morning. I want you to welcome a very dear friend of mine. This is Mark Stockland. All right, everybody. Have fun, man. I got to steal your mic. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Justin. For the invitation, it's always a pleasure to be here. My favorite highlight for being here so far is going to, was it Rentown Ren yesterday for breakfast? But going with, it wouldn't have been the same if it was just my family. When you get to go to breakfast with Pastor Justin and Jen, you take that opportunity because it is a blast. I felt like we were living our college days, you know, just causing ruckus. I'm surprised they let us stay there. They didn't kick us out. We were by far the loudest people uh, in the place. 
<laughs> I don't know if you guys get excited about that. It was awesome. The food was great. I ate all the bread, the apple butter. It was amazing. I did live in Napanee for two years. Um, so I, I do have a little, I'm an Iowa farm boy. Uh, I grew up in northern Iowa. Uh, so I do have some roots up in this area. Uh, true story. I never have taken my wife, Lacey, and my three kids to Napanee. But yesterday after breakfast, I decided to cruise over there and just show them the house I lived in for a couple years. We drive by, say, here's where we live. Here's where my dad was the pastor. I take a picture of it, and I say, let's just head to the park down the road where I used to play football with my brothers and the neighbor kids. We go there. There's this lady there with her grandson, and she says, you from here? I said, no, I used to live here back when I was 12, 13 years old. And I said, I lived in the uh, two-story brick and white house with a two-car garage. She says, the one with the basket, basketball hoop out there too. And I was like, yeah, the white and brick one. She goes, well, that's the only one. She goes, I live there now. <laughs> so we had, a, we had a 20, 30 minute conversation about that. Just like Justin said, what are the odds that the day we go there? And so it was, it was pretty special. So it's good to be back here. Um, again, my name is Mark Stockland. I'm the CEO director for Haiti Bible Mission. Uh, my family has lived in Jeremy Haiti uh, for thir almost 13 years, 12 and a half years. My family, especially my kids, have spent more time in Haiti than they have the U.S., the last four or five years, though, we've slowly transitioned to spend a little bit more time in the U.S. as I travel and speak and fundraise, and we do not have a lot of U.S. staff. We have a lot of Haitian uh, staff and team, but we don't have a lot of U.S., so I'm kind of in charge of fundraising, but that is also what we're trying to do in Haiti, is our mission vision is empowering leaders to transform communities. We don't want it to be about me and Lacey. We don't want it to be about us. We don't want it to be about the Americans, the white people. We want it to be about the Haitian indigenous leaders, them running the churches, them running the schools. They're doing the ministry, and we're just there to lift arms and empower. So when Justin and, and New Song, you guys came down, you were helping plant, but you were giving training, and you were giving a helping hand so that then the Haitians can in turn lead the ministry. So the focus, what does empowering look like? So my heart has always been, I'm an Iowa farm boy, so I feel I'm, I'm kind of like Moses and the disciples, like I'm untrained, right? I'm just a farm boy. Uh, God, what can you do with me? I'm not going to be on the top charts with education. But sometimes I feel like if any of you are like me, you feel maybe people can overlook you. But I see in the scripture where Jesus took 12 ordinary men and he changed the whole world. So my heart has always been to look for men and women, young high school, college age men and women that have a heart and character and potential of leadership. But the government's just overlooking them because the world's overlooking them because they're just not a top student. You with me? I mean, a lot of people can do great things if everyone has the top-notch education, but also God's always looking at the inside, the heart and character. So that's what I really take pride in is finding men and women and then saying, hey, what do you want to do in life? And they say, hey, I want to be a doctor. I want to be a nurse. I want to be a pastor. Uh, one girl right now, she's 18, Esther, um, she wants to be in construction and be an architect. I'm like, all right, well, then how can I come alongside and partner? So we've invited her into our program, and what we'll do is we'll, I fundraise, get her the money to pay for her education. While she's going to school, we put her through discipleship. We want all of our men and women to not only be successful, you might say, in business or in the, the, the secular world, which I think is important. We, we also want them to be biblically sound. We want them to have a foundation of the gospel, know how to be in discipleship. We want strong men and women to become great moms and dads, to be great husbands and fathers, right, and, and mothers. And we, we need that because well, here's what I sense. I sense a lot of missions that are really good at the Bible and teaching. So you got these people that love Jesus, you might say, but they can't afford to pay their bills and contribute to society and they're poor. Or you have the other side where you got these missions that really train all this education and jobs. So you got people making money, but they don't have a sound um, a foundation of the biblical principles. And so we have marriages falling apart, right? We're, we're, we're not in the word of God. So I'm like, why can't we combine the two? Amen? Nothing wrong with that. Let's, let's combine both. Let, let's help you in your education. But man, we want to see healthy marriages, healthy families, because that will ultimately, and I, I wish my wife Lacey, because I love listening to her talk about it, because as a mother, her perspective, what she sees is when you invest in a mom, you invest in a dad, and you help them, the, the, you're helping take them out of that poverty and breaking that cycle, because now you have families staying together. You have families training their kids about what a healthy marriage and family looks like and how to balance the budget and how to tithe and, and do the things that help contribute back to not only the economy, but healthy biblical families. Does that make sense? It's all this dry air. I'll, I'll pound this water, I promise you. This is like all this dry air up here and the humidity I'm used to in Haiti, you know? 
but that, that is our focus. So we, we have five different church plants that we planted. Like I said, the one that uh, you guys have helped plant. We've got pastors overseas. We have two schools, Christian schools. Uh, man, so many great teachers. We have discipleship programs. We do sports outreach. We do many things. But all the things that are done are done through the men and women that are in our program at Haiti Ball Mission. They're the ones going down to the hospital, like Justin said. And actually, my 11-year-old daughter, three years ago when she was eight, she started a ministry called Haiti's Heroes. She goes down and she fundraises herself. She asks for money. She sells shirts. There's some out in the lobby there that um, any money that she gets, she takes it down to the hospital. And every single week, she pays for every child's prescription in the hospital, every single one, to make sure. Because in Haiti, it's different than America. America, you get in, you get treated. I've been to the hospital many, many times. They treat you, and then they come after you for money, right? Like, that's, that's the way it is. If you don't have insurance, if you do, it's like save the life, and then we'll get the money later. Not in Haiti. It's the doctor will look at you and say, you're sick. Okay, well, where's the money? Here's what you need, but you don't have the money, so they don't give it to you. So you got families sitting there with children with a prescription. I, I can't afford to pay for that. So that's where we come in as my daughter literally comes down. She also has these goodie bags that she brings, like food and snacks and toys for the kids and earrings for the mom and just tries to love on them and pray for them. And so I'm so blessed as a, as a father to watch my daughter just take over for three years that ministry of helping uh, helping every single kid every week at that hospital. And we're not here. She gives the, the, the money and the gifts to the, to the Haitian leaders, and they're going down to that hospital every single week to share the gospel, but to make sure that needs are being met. And I'm so proud of her. And then my 13-year-old son, uh, every single weekend, he invites all the neighbor kids and kids from town to play soccer. He's a phenomenal soccer player. And he wants to share the gospel and to watch him sit there and share the gospel in Creole to these kids and say, you guys need to know the most important thing in my life, and that's Jesus. Then he buys them lunch, gives them drinks, and they'll play soccer from 8.30 in the morning till 5, 6 at in the afternoon. It's so awesome to watch. And my son's partner in crime is, uh, a, we call him our son now because we're adopting a 12-year-old Haitian, Haitian boy right now, and those two, Barrick and Minister, just tag team it, man, just to see my two boys just going after all these neighbor kids and saying, let's play soccer. Let's do what we love to do. But before we do, can I just tell you about Jesus? And I love it. Those kids are coming to church. So uh, I like talking about Haiti Ball Mission, but can I be honest? I like talking about what my kids are doing more because I believe it's an Elisha, Elijah thing, man. I, I pray a double portion. I pray that my kids would do 10 times, and I believe they will, more than their dad, more than me and Lacey ever will do uh, as, as they just have a heart to chase and run after Jesus. So kids listening, you're not too young. You're not too young to make a difference in this community, in this church, at your school. When God's put something on your heart, man, go for it. Uh, you'll impact as people are watching. So uh, God is good. We do have some shirts and things out there if you want to get some Haiti Ball Mission swag, you know what I mean? We got some cool stuff. You know, I can see you really want to sport some of that for us. So we'd love to see you go out there and, uh, and support some of the, the prophets there. Go to my kids' ministries and uh, the hospital. So we'd love to... Uh, have you guys partake of that. So any other questions, we're, we'll be in the back afterward. I don't want to take the whole time talk about Haiti Ball Mission. I could. Uh, it's what we've been doing, like I said, for almost 13 years, and I love it. Um, but uh, I think we can spend uh, two or three minutes in God's Word. Does that sound good? Just wrap up real quick. <laughs> We should just close right now because I don't want to be the guy. This guy preached forever. Justin's always talking and preaching forever. We should just close in prayer, go home. No, we'll, we'll, we'll spend a few minutes, so. Let, let, me, let me pray as we transition. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for your goodness. God, thank you for this opportunity to be here. God, I'm thankful for Pastor Justin and Jen. God, their friendship, their investment into to my marriage. God, their investment into our ministry and into my personal life. God, I'm thankful for their friendship. God, thank you for this church, this ministry. God, I pray that you would continually bless New Song. God, if they'd be able to help change lives uh, in here, make disciples to go out, God, and reach this community for you. God, I pray that the words that I say, God, would be yours. God, that my motives would be your motives, God, that uh, you would start to open ears and soften hearts, God, to receive what you have today. And it's your precious name we pray. Amen. If you want, you can open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. There's a popular uh, passage there. They call it the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5, let's read uh, verses 38 through 48. Starting verse 38. It says, you have heard it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, 
let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is heaven. For he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. That's not convicting at all, is it? Oh my goodness. Today's title of my message, guys, is live life in the second mile. Live life in the second mile. A little background, this, this message takes place early on in Jesus' ministry. Chapter 3, you got Jesus getting baptized by John the Baptist, and you get into chapter 4, and you, you see Jesus is out in the wilderness being tempted. So he's just coming off of baptism. This is early on in his ministry, and, and uh, now he's being tempted. He comes out of that, and so this is where he sees all these people and all his disciples, and so he's going to go and teach and train and talk about his kingdom. What Jesus starts to do, though, is he starts to explain his kingdom and what he's about and what he's doing and what he sees for his kingdom and his reign and what he wants for his people. But he also has to, he has to clear up some misunderstanding because what the people were believing about what reality was, what the kingdom was, what the law says, Jesus has to break down that misunderstanding and talk about because they were expecting a kingdom of something else. And Jesus is like, let me tell you about what I'm about and what my kingdom. Give an example. For instance, in Exodus 21, this is when Jesus is giving the law and helping write the law with Moses and the children of Israel. He's talking about if a, if a man kills a goat, you guys remember that? You must repay and, kill the, and give re, repay with a goat. If somebody were to steal and he's given the law, like here's what you would do. You would repay for what you stole. If a man beats his servant, right, here's what we would pay. So, so he's helping write that law about stealing and about goats and, and everything. He's creating that law. So it's like if I stole from you, God's like, here's the law. You're going to repay the same. So the, the, the problem, though, is that they're believing that this is supposed to be like the exact. There is no room for, um, for growth. This is the law. And Jesus is basically going to say, let me clear this up. This isn't just like an obligation. You're looking, you're so focused on like the law and the rule. And God's like, I'm focused on the heart. And God's going to kind of shape and change what, what they're doing. If you look at how many times... I only read 10 verses, but if you go back, there's six times where Jesus says, you have heard that it was said, and then he says, but I say to you. He talks about uh, in verse 21, you've heard it said to those of old, you shall not murder. But then Jesus says, but I say to you, everyone who is angry, right? He takes it up a notch. God's just not like, well, you haven't murdered. God takes it up a notch. He also says, but you've heard it said that those who commit adultery, so people say, well, I've never committed adultery. And God's, God takes it up another notch, right? He says, but I say to you, even to have a thought of it, you've committed adultery. See, so many people are like, they're, the law, this is what it says. God is more concerned about the heart, the intent, than the letter of the law. We're so, con we're so like, though, this is the law. God doesn't want just the, 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 the letter of the law. God's really intent is the heart. Amen. God's, God's behind the heart. He's way more concerned about that. I love the passage in verse 41 where, where it says that if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Did you guys know that in the Bible times that the Roman soldiers, when they occupied the land there, that they had, it was law that you had to carry their gear, their pack, their, their gear for one mile. Did you guys know that? So like if you're sitting there selling in the marketplace, and it's a great picture because in Haiti, everybody buys and sells in like open markets, is that the Roman soldiers are tired. They could say by law, they could say, hey, Justin, carry this right now. Justin had to drop everything he was doing, grab the gear and walk one mile. Imagine that. You're busy. You're <laughs> involved with your life. Hey, get, get, get out of the tractor. Let's go. You're carrying this. That was the law. That's a hard thing to do, but that's why I believe Jesus calls us to live in the second mile because he says that when somebody says, go one, go two, what separates us from the people out there, the, the people in the world that don't know Jesus? 
too many times we're just like so intent. This is what the law says. I carried the pack. Here you go. Drop it on the ground. I've gone my mile. That's it. That's typical. Am I right? What, what if it looked like this? All right, we're done. I, I, I'll go another mile. No, you, you fulfilled your requirement. I, I, I know, but can I just love on you and bless you? Let's go two miles. Let's carry this a second mile. Jesus is always saying, here's what the law says. But he's like, Here, here's what I say. Let, let, let's live in that second mile. Let's not just do the bare minimum. Why is it that that's the, that tends to be, we swing the pendulum, right, pretty far. That's the bare minimum. We, we got to tie 10%. Really? That's just the bare minimum. Like, that's just the requirement. Why God's like, I want your heart to be above and beyond. Let's live in that second mile. Oh, we're going to tip at a restaurant? Oh, we only got to give 10, 15, 20%. Really? Who says? That's like an unspoken law. I used to wait on tables. I, people, need to, people need to live. Why is it that we always try to do the bare minimum? Let's go the second mile, start separating ourselves, and live in a life that honors the Lord and sets us apart. I can tell you, I haven't been perfect, but I will tell you this, that when we live in that second mile, people ask questions. Why would you carry that pack for me two miles? Why would you tip like that? Because it's not my money. It's God's money. I can't take it with me. Turn the other cheek. You guys heard that, right? Turn the other cheek. You guys know the turn the other cheek when it says in here that if somebody slaps you, it says slaps you on the right cheek in verse 39. I think a lot of people think of like a punch, but it wasn't. A slap, if we're having a conversation, basically Jesus is saying that it, it, it's a backhanded, right? You slap across the cheek and then turn the other, let them do the same to that one. In those times, and, and you probably remember the old movies too, where the general would pull his gloves off, right, and slap somebody across. It was humiliation. It was an embarrassment. It, 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 you were just humiliated beyond measure in front of people publicly, right? I mean, imagine that, just being slapped openly in front of people with a backhand. That's what it's referring to. It's not so much of injury as much as it is an insult, an emotional thing, emotional damage, right? And I think people forget that, and they're just like, oh, turn the other cheek, you know, and I hear all these people on TV talking about that. Well, that's really not per se the physical. I mean, that does happen. But God's talking about here that insult. Turn, take, take, it, take a second chance at that, you know? Like, hey, take one, let's take two. Jesus modeled living in the second mile. He was persecuted. He was called a glutton and a sinner. He was betrayed. He was mocked. Jesus experienced it all. Would you agree? So what does it look like to live in the second mile? I think Jesus is the best one to go to for that. He's my hero. I think if you want to flip over, you don't have to, but in John chapter 13, can we just look and see how Jesus modeled living in the second mile? That helps me because when I'm struggling, I go, God, how, how can I live in the second mile? I think this is the best example of someone living in the second mile to me. This is the story of Jesus washing the disciples' feet, John chapter 13. I'm going to read just the first five and then we'll skip down, but it says, now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that this hour had come to depart, out of this world to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper, he laid aside his outer garments, and taking a towel, he tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Then if you go down to verse 12, it says, when he had washed their feet, and he had put on his outer garments, he resumed his place and said to them, do you understand what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right for so I am. If I then your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done for you. How about that? <laughs> Can I just shoot straight with you? Jesus knows everything about us, knew everything about the disciples. He knew that Judas was going to betray me. I don't know if you remember this. When Jesus said, one of you is going to betray me, notice all the disciples were like, which one? Is it me? Is it me? They were questioning that. 
Why? Because Judas had lived a life, a lie, but he was actually so good at fitting in. I mean, imagine if he was a bad person every day with his character. All the disciples would have said, well, I know who it is. It's going to be Judas. But it wasn't. He blended in. So all the disciples were like, who, who is it? But God knew what was going to happen, and he could see to the heart of it. Here's what's crazy. God knowing what Judas was going to do. Here, let me tell you what I would have done. I would have washed 11 feet. That's what I would have done. <laughs> Anybody with me? You would have washed 11. Why? Because you're about to betray me. You're going to betray me, so I'm not going to wash your feet. That's what Jesus knew that. There's so many times we don't know what you're going to do today, tomorrow, but God does, and yet he gets down and washes our feet anyway. Man. That's why God's in charge and not me. So many times we're seeking justice instead of love. What did Jesus give up to live in that second mile? You ever think about that? What it takes, what, what you have to give up to live in that second mile? It's not easy, right? Definitely not easy. Jesus, I think, there's a couple things that I think about. I think number one is he gave up his position. Man, that's a tough one. He gave up his position to live in the second mile. Jesus is king, creator of the world. The Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end. God is almighty. He walks on water, parts the sea, feeds 5,000 with a couple loaves of bread and fish. This is God who created man and breathed life into us. And he takes his outer garment off and gets down on his hands and knees. And he starts washing feet. Man, he modeled that. He gave up his position to live in that second mile. To go above and beyond and model that for us. Number two is he gave up his time. Serving and living the second mile takes time, guys. It's not easy. You can stick around and help the boss late after work. Takes time. You can serve your wife and make some food after you've had a long day. Takes time. It's hard work. Run your kids to soccer practice, live in that second mile. Help stick around and fix somebody's flat tire when you're pressed and heading where you're going. Takes time. That's hard to give up. Time is precious, right? But when you live in that second mile, we could give our time, as Jesus did, to serve and love those around us. I think the third thing that Jesus gave up is he gave up his, re his right to retaliate. Mm. That's a tough one, isn't it? Jesus gave up his right to retaliate. Of anyone in this room in the world, none of us can really retaliate, right? We've all sinned. Jesus was absolutely perfect. He did deserve it. And he could have retaliated. He could have come back and said, you know what? Because you're denying me, because you're doing this, here's what I'm going to... No. Jesus gave up his right to retaliate, and he just served. And he loved unconditionally. He lived in that second mile by giving up his position, his time, and his right to retaliate. Jesus lived in the second mile by being a humble servant. By being a humble servant. My first year, we've been in Haiti 12 and a half years, going on 13 years now. My first year in Haiti, I used to play basketball. I'm a, I'm a big basketball guy. I played for the city championship in Jeremy for three years. I was on the, 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 the big team. We had all the big cities come. We'd have tournaments. And we won the city championship three years in a row. I was averaging 25 points a game, playing amazing. Well, my first year there, I, I cut through the paint to, to take a pass. The guy that's guarding me, they were pretty mad that I was scoring. He just threw his elbow up when I was cutting through on purpose, broke my nose. I blacked out, fell to the ground. Blood everywhere. I was a wreck. Scored only five points that game. <laughs> Can I shoot straight with you guys? I did not respond as Jesus. <laughs> I'm sure you, Justin, you definitely would have responded because I know you're a man of the cloth. You would never get mad at somebody punching you. I was so angry and I wanted justice. I wanted the revenge. I wanted to get even with him because I felt like I didn't deserve it. But over the next couple of weeks, God just challenged and convicted me that God's like, but I died for that guy too. And how are you going to be different if you move to Haiti and you don't love the unlovable? You need to live in the second mile. I was not perfect, but God had to really break me. Maybe you can't relate to a physical injury, but how about this? When Justin and I met up on Friday, I said, you're never going to believe this. But in all reality, I know he does because he said, oh, it's the way it is for him too. 
I said, as I'm preparing this message, I'm like, yeah, I've lived it. I've gone through some things, but this very week, I'm on the phone with my pastors in Haiti and they're expressing to me and we're finding where we're being attacked verbally on social media, pictures and lies being spread about some of my pastors and about my family. Anybody else relate to lies? Can I be, let me be honest, getting my nose broken and punched was a lot easier to cope with than the verbal slander of my family and my pastors and ministry. Would you guys agree? Whoever said sticks and stones may break my bones, but words never hurt me, that's a lie. Words are so hurtful. Words are so powerful. You can either breathe life or death. When Jesus cursed the tree, it was cursed. When Jesus said, rise from the dead, they rose from the dead. Words have power and speak life. We need to be people to speak life. But I'll tell you, that was hard to cope with. But as Justin said, that's because God knows you need to be reminded that this is a chance for you to live in that second mile. The, I, me and my pastors are trying to live in this right now, to be honest with you, right now this week. It's tough. I'd rather take somebody punching me than the words, because words hurt. But also Satan knows this message was going to be preached, and he's coming after us, and he's saying things, and I have a choice. I can retaliate, or I can live in the second mile. Jesus lived in the second mile because his mission was to be a humble servant and draw people to himself. That was his mission, right? Living on the same mission as Jesus will help us live in that second mile. If we follow Jesus' mission, I believe we'll be able to live in that second mile. Jesus was always going above and beyond, wasn't he? Do we? Jesus was always going above and beyond. The woman at the well? How about the woman caught in adultery? How about Peter's denial? How about Judas' betrayal? How about the people when he's at the cross, when they said, you call yourself the son of God, come off the cross. You can save others, save yourself. He's being mocked and persecuted. His mission was to draw people to himself with love and to be a humble servant. This is what I'm convinced of. There are no traffic jams in the second mile. (laughs) There's no traffic jams in the second mile, but it's pretty congested in the first mile, I'll tell you that, because that's where everybody seems to be living in that first mile. Let me do the bare minimum. I'll go to church. I'll tithe my 10%. Well, that guy said that. I'm going to ignore him. I'll get back at him. I'm going to live in the first mile because I'm going to do the law. The law says. But Jesus says. Don't worry about the law says. What does Jesus say? How can we live in that second mile? And here's what I believe today. I believe that God is calling all of us, me included, to give up our position. You're not better than anybody. I'm not better. My sins put Jesus to the cross. Your sins put Jesus to the cross. I believe God is calling us to give up our time, to serve, to love, and love the unlovable. And sometimes that unlovable person's me too. I also believe God's calling us to give up our right to retaliate. Amen. God's saying, give, give these things up. Be a humble servant. Follow. Jesus said after he washed the disciples' feet, he says, as I have done, you go and do also. Today, guys, I believe God is calling us to a lifestyle, a lifestyle of living in the second mile. That's what I believe God's calling us to do. Live in that second mile. Take him at his word. We don't need to seek justice. We don't need to seek revenge. We can be humble servants. Live on the same mission as Jesus and be people that live in the second mile and separate ourselves from the pack, from the crowd, the way the rest of the world's living. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for your goodness, God. I thank you for your presence today. God, I pray that you would help us be people that live a lifestyle of living in the second mile. God, I just pray, God, that you would give us a supernatural strength because, God, apart from you, I can't do that. God, apart from you, we can't do that. God, because it's hard to love and serve and wash the feet of people who have persecuted us, that have said things that have hurt us. God, many of us here probably have never experienced physical harm, but the emotional damage from things being said about us or to us, God, it's hard. 
God, would you forgive us for the bitterness and that maybe the anger or resentment we've had toward others? God, would you teach us to be humble servants, to live in that second mile? God, I pray right now, God, that you would change this community. God, and I wonder what would the workplaces look like where we work, God, if we lived in the second mile? God, what would our marriage look like if we lived in the second mile in our marriages and our homes? God, what would this church look like if everyone that calls New Song our home, God, if we lived in the second mile of serving, of loving, of giving up our time? God, what would this community of Plymouth look like, God, if we lived in the second mile? God, where we were just loving on people, being on the same mission as you, Jesus. God, I want to see people leave this place today, God. Encouraged, fired up, following your lead and example, God, of loving the unlovable, serving, living in the second mile. God, I pray that people start asking questions. What is, there's something different about you. Why would you do that? Because Jesus washed my feet. Jesus died for me. And if Jesus can model this and he can give me strength, God, then I can love those who are unlovable. God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for sending your son. It's your precious name we pray. Amen.